Okay, so um, we're, we're looking at Zechariah, but before we get into the, uh, the lesson, uh, last week, uh, Carol asked a question about Zion. So we had, we had a question last week about Zion, and um, I gave a, a, an answer, and as I was editing the video, I was thinking, wait a minute, and so I started to look into it, and it, it's not that my answer was absolutely wrong, but at the same time, it wasn't accurate either. <laughs> and so, um, so before we get into the to the lesson, I thought we we you know take a track back and at least look in and see what Zion is. Okay, so what is uh, Zion? Uh, it's actually a phrase that's used a whole bunch in the Old Testament. And it originally kind of comes from when um, David, after he consolidated the kingdom, uh, he attacked the old Jebusite city, uh, which became Jerusalem. And there was a hill there in, uh, uh, in Jerusalem uh, that is Zion. And so that's kind of where the, the, the phrase started. And so when you take a look at um, the Old Testament, um, sometimes Zion is synonymous with Jerusalem. And so, you know, as you're reading through things and you read about Jerusalem and you read Zion, sometimes it's just a, an over um, uh, statement of, uh, of Jerusalem, okay? But sometimes Zion has to do with the inhabitants of Jerusalem instead of the place of Jerusalem. And uh, sometimes, in fact, it's, it's in our lesson tonight, there's going to be a phrase of daughter of Zion, and what that is really talking about is just simply the inhabitants, the people there in Jerusalem too, okay? And so if you think about the, the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, well, what, what's special about the inhabitants of Jerusalem? Well, they're Jews, and so they're God's chosen people. And so there is another kind of little uh, uh, layer to the, to the meaning of Zion, is that it really has to do with just simply God's chosen people and God's people in, in general. And since we're talking about God's uh, people, then we're talking about God and His relationship with people. And so there comes in the, the idea about the temple. I don't know if the hill Zion is um, the, the, the Mount Moriah where the temple was, or if it's a hill slightly south of that. I, I, I just don't know. Uh, but... Um, you know, it can refer to that hill and it can refer to um, the temple because that's where God dwells and that's where God is. And so, you know, as I was saying last, last week, you know, I was a little bit accurate or a little bit right, but at the same time, it wasn't very accurate. And, you know, when we talk about um, the Bible, uh, you know, we need, we need to have some accuracy, right? You know, and there, there's going to be times that, um, you know, I'm going to say things that, you just sometimes got to go, you know, know what I mean instead of what I say, because, you know, sometimes you get things kind of twisted around. Uh, for example, if, you know, I'm giving a, a lesson on Moses and I say, the, the, you know, the name Noah, uh, you know, you got to, re oh, no, he's talking about Moses. By the way, um, how many animals did Moses put on the ark? None. But I said that because, you know, a lot of times if, if you hit somebody with that question uh, without, you know, Moses, Noah, they're, they're going to say, well, two. And then I don't know why it is that um, Noah, uh, you know, has it, it for some reason, Noah and Moses get confused in a lot of people's minds. Um, does it yours? No. 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 Carol? Yeah. When you asked that question, I was thinking. Two. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it. It, it if, I, I don't. It, it, it's that way in my mind too. So you know, that's kind of one of those trick questions of how many animals did Moses put on the ark? You know, there's going to be a many people who answer two, uh, just simply because they get Noah and Moses mixed up. Okay, so sometimes you know, there's there's that kind of thing, right? And you know, there's sometimes that you might get a, a date wrong. I might get a date wrong, saying you know it. Uh, the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity in 586 BC and or 536 BC, and somebody said, "No, it was 537." Well, those dates are all due to historians, you know, and so you might get one and some. How many animals did Noah put? Huh? Yes. How many animals? It was it was two of every unclean, and then seven 
pair or seven each of every clean animal. So not two. No, not two. But the common answer is two. <laughs> so I don't. Two I've never, I've never met anyone to say you put two on the ark. Two of each. Two of each kind on the ark. Oh. That's the only one. We're supposed to be reading between the lines. <laughs> <laughs> Moses put. Moses. See there, I did it. Noah put two animals on the ark. No. Okay. Anyway, getting back to the idea, you know, it, it is good to kind of, you know, have a degree of accuracy about um, the Bible, and, you know, if, if I make a mistake about something, I, I, try, I try to be accurate, but if I make a mistake, I need to correct it, and so, so there is the correction, all right? Um, you got any questions on that? Okay. All right, so tonight we are going to continue with our view of um, Zechariah then, and um, what we looked at last week was kind of getting into um, the book of Zechariah a little bit, and we saw that Zechariah really was, uh, is a, a book of uh, five different messages that Zechariah took from the Lord. Three of those messages are dated, and so uh, we looked at that first dated message last night, which is really just simply um, the Lord reminding the Jews that had come back from Babylonian captivity the reason why they went to Babylonian captivity and then the Jews responding, everything that you did uh, to our forefathers, that was right, okay? So we looked at that, and then we looked at that uh, second, um, uh, started to take a look at that second message, okay? And if you recall, uh, that second message is really just a series of eight different visions uh, that Zechariah saw. And we looked at two of them. We looked at the horsemen among the myrtle trees, and we looked at the four horns and the four craftsmen. And one thing that, um, you know, we, we looked at, or I talked about last week, is that this style of writing is called apocalyptic writing. Now, when we hear the word apocalypse, most people oftentimes think, in time, but that's not what the word apocalypse means at all. Instead, the word apocalypse uh, is really comes from a Greek word which means to reveal. And the book of Revelation, the reason why it's called the apocalypse is just simply it is the revelation that God gave to John to write those things down so that we can see it. Now, the style of writing where um, it's, it's there in Revelation, and that's the reason why it's called apocalyptic writing, is also frequently used in the Old Testament as well. Right here in the book of Zechariah is an example. And it's just simply uh, a means by which God allowed uh, Zechariah to see some very heavily um, um, very uh, images, okay, uh, and it's very heavily metaphor. And so in, in seeing those images, uh, those are to convey a message. Now, in looking at these eight visions, I, I don't have all the answers for them. I'm going to say that right off the bat. Um, I don't think that we have to make every single thing mean something. Okay? And by saying that, I'm going to say that, you, you know, God, when he, uh, for example, with a horseman amongst the, more, um, horseman amongst the myrtle trees, uh, you remember that there was a red horse, there's a brown horse, and there was um, 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 multicolored horses as well. And so it's kind of like, okay, well, what did the colors mean? Well, there was a meaning because God gave, you know, told and saw, let Zachariah see the colors and everything and inspired him to write it. But, uh, you know, you don't have to know what those colors are to understand kind of what that vision is. And so that's kind of what we're looking at tonight with these um, visions is just simply kind of seeing what, you know, maybe what these visions are as far as the bigger picture. Now, as far as the horsemen amongst the myrtle trees, if you recall, um, here are these horses and the uh, riders that are there, and uh, they are supposed to go through the whole earth, and they're supposed to see what's going on. And what we saw was that uh, as they reported back that the land was at peace and the land was at rest, um, and God was looking at Jerusalem and seeing that the destruction there at Jerusalem uh, was something that the nations that he allowed to do it had gone overboard. And so God had said 
that he was going to go and he was going to judge the nations uh, more. And so what we can see is that maybe this is just simply a judgment of the nations. Okay? And again, there's, there's other things there, but, um, you know, we can at least look at that and just see. Now, with the four horns, and we're talking about four crafted horns because we've got the four craftsmen who did it, the horns are symbols of power that scattered the Jews into captivity. Um, and uh, again, you can look at it and you can see, okay, well, what nations did it? And you can start picking out nations. Um, and you may be right and you may be wrong. I don't know. But, you know, just kind of boiling it down real quick, let's just say, hey, the, the, there was powers that came in, nations that came in, judged Israel, scattered them, and then the craftsmen were there to scare the, 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 the horn, so to speak, to bring them back in. And so what we can see is the scattering and uh, return gathering of Israel. Okay? Okay, so that's what we looked at. And, um, you know, we're going to try to get through all, through all eight visions tonight. Maybe we can. Uh, if we don't, we'll just uh, finish up, you know, next week. But let's go ahead and take a look at Zechariah chapter 2, and we will get into the next uh, vision, which is a man with a measuring line, okay? All right. So Zechariah chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, Then I looked up, and there before me was a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, Where are you going? He answered me to measure Jerusalem, to find out how wide and how long it is. Then the angel who was speaking to me left, and another angel came to meet him and said to him, this is talking about the man with the measuring line now. He said, run, tell that young man, oh, excuse me, there's another man. And said, run and tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of men and livestock in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory from within. And so here we've got, you know, Zachariah seeing this man with a measuring line. Hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm going to go measure Jerusalem. Okay. Why, why would you measure Jerusalem? Well, because it's got boundaries and you're wanting to mark out the boundaries, you know. And so the cities at that time, you got walls. And so it'd be easy to say, okay, well, Jerusalem is, you know, this wide and it's this long. And from there, here are its boundaries. And as he's going to go do it, then we have another angel come and tell somebody else, hey, go catch that, that young man and tell him that, that Jerusalem is going to be bigger than that. And the reason why Jerusalem is going to be bigger than that is because um, the Lord is going to be there. And what we see in verse number five is again saying that I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within and so um, here the Lord is going to be the wall, and so there's not going to be a need for a wall, and so you can't measure it, right? Lord's going to be the wall itself, and the Lord is going to be there being its glory within. Now, let me ask you, when is this going to take place? Did it take place in um, Zechariah's day? Well, it did in, the, in regards to the Lord figuratively being there. But, um, and it, it was in terms of the Lord protected Jerusalem um, because at this time when, when Zechariah was there, um, the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. And as a matter of fact, they weren't going to be rebuilt later until 444 B.C. when Nehemiah brought the third group of people back into the land. Okay. And so, but at that time, there were walls that were reconstructed, okay? And so, yes, the Lord is there. The Lord is protecting them um, in, a, a, um, um, in a sense. But I, I think that what this is saying, as far as the Lord is going to be a wall of fire around it, and the Lord is going to be there as far as the glory, He is going to be the glory within, that this is going to be something that is yet to occur in our future. This is going to be when Jesus returns and he sets up his millennial kingdom. And when he sets up his kingdom, where is, where is it going to be set up? In Jerusalem. Okay? And so the glory of the Lord is going to be there in Jerusalem. 
And during that millennial reign, is there going to be, uh, you know, a, a need for a wall? Well, no, because, uh, you know, the Lord's going to be there and it's going to be a time of peace and a time of prosperity. And even going further into the, uh, to the heavenly ages, you know, that's going to be the case. Okay. And so now we kind of got an idea about what this, this measuring line is. Now, continuing on down. It says in verse 10, did you notice the lily of the valley line is from there? Uh, no, I didn't. Where do, where do you see that? Well, the Lily of Valley is about the, the names of Jesus. So, the Lily of the Valley is a quote from, I can't remember where that one comes from. Oh, uh, Wall of Fire About Me. I oh, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then back to Exodus with this man that he, my hungry soul, showed me. That's right. Well, I, I didn't really think about all of that. It's all the, the song spell the different characterizations of yeah. So, a wall of fire from Zechariah. Okay. Well, when you said the lily of the valley, I was like, I don't remember seeing lily of the valley. Lily of the valley is so. But I see that wall of fire. Which book is lily of the valley from? I can't remember. I don't know. You you have to look it up and tell me. Is it from Psalms? I, I, I honestly don't know. You'll have to look it up and tell me. And so. Okay. So, looking at verse number six. It says, come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Come, O Zion. Oh, there's that, that name. Escape, you who live in the daughter of Babylon. Now, why daughter of Babylon? Because we're talking about the, the, the Jewish people that are living in Babylon, right? And so here are the people who have been there in captivity and the people that were still there at the time of this... Um, this writing. And he says, for this is what the Lord Almighty says, after what the Lord Almighty, uh, for this is what the Lord Almighty says, after he has honored me and sent me against the nations that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. I will surely raise my hand against them so that their slaves will be, so that their slaves will plunder them. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. Shout and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming, and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. And I will live among you, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. And so here we've got the idea about the measuring line and how it doesn't need to be measured because it's going to be all-encompassing at that time. And so, you know, here we have the Jews that are going to be coming back into the land. It's talking about the millennial kingdom. The Lord is going to be there, and the Lord is going to be his, their, their God. They're going to be His people. And not just simply the Jews, but all nations, too, are going to fall under that umbrella. Okay? All right. So as far as the man with the measuring line, you know, what, what can we just get from that? A, a, a little quick summation. How about... Jerusalem unmeasured because of the Lord... Okay. Now again, there's there's probably a lot of other things that we can take from that, right? You know, but we can at least take that. Okay. So you ready to move on to chapter uh, three? Okay. So in chapter three, we've got a um, clean garments for Joshua, the high priest. Verse number one. It says, "Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest." Now. If you remember, uh, back in our study in, in Haggai, Joshua is going to be the high priest that's there at that time, and uh, he's going to be the ruler of the, the religious side of the returning Jews. Who's the ruler of the political side of the returning Jews? You remember his name? It's a little bit more complicated than Joshua. It begins with a Z. Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, okay. 
We're going to talk about Zerubbabel in just a minute. Is he the Antichrist? Uh, well, actually, these both are, and we're going to talk about them. Okay, in in Haggai, uh, uh, Zerubbabel is the type of Christ. They're the two in the the next vision. Yes, which we're going to talk about. <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay, so here we've got Joshua. All right, the high priest. He's standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Which, by the way, that's exactly what Satan is and what Satan does, is that he's there accusing us of, of sin before the Lord. Now the Lord, in verse 2, said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now, what do you suppose that means? That here Joshua is a burning stick snatched from the fire. Well, let's put it this way. If Joshua was not snatched out of the fire, what would happen to the burning stick? It'd burn up. Okay. And so the, the, the rescuing of Joshua has to do with an action that is given to him, right? Okay. It's not something that he does. It's an action given to him. Now, here we've got Satan that is there accusing Joshua before the Lord. Now, are those accusations true? Probably so, because Joshua is a sinner like you and I, right? And so there's not much point for Satan to go and make false accusations of Joshua before the Lord, because the Lord knows what's true and false. But for the Lord, uh, Satan to go and make true accusations of Joshua then that would carry a little bit more weight now, wouldn't it? And by the way, the same could be true for you and I. But here is Joshua, and the Lord is describing him as a stick that's been pulled out of the fire. And so by pulling him out of the fire, then he is obviously rescued or saved. Okay? Okay. And it's all due to the Lord and all due to the Lord's grace. Now, in verse number 3, it says, Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put rich garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. So here's Joshua. He's got on dirty clothes. What do the dirty clothes represent? Sin. Right? Because it says so there in um, verse number, um, what is that? Verse number four. Okay? And so the Lord is forgiving his sin, and the Lord is putting on clean garments. If the dirty garments represent sin, what do the clean garments represent? Forgiveness or the opposite of sin is salvation and righteousness. Okay, so salvation, righteousness, which comes from being forgiven, right? Okay, and so here Joshua has these dirty garments. Satan's been accusing him. The Lord is going to give him righteousness, okay? And so if you think about our sal salvation that we have with the Lord, it's not something that we do to atone for our sin. It's the fact that God credits righteousness to us. That's what salvation is all about when we are forgiven of our sin, okay? And so here we have Joshua, and since Joshua has now been um, cleansed and he's able to stand before the Lord in clean garments, and by the way, um, it, it would have been uh, not right for the high priest to stand serving the Lord in dirty garments. Uh, it, you know, he had to have his garments clean before he could go and actually serve before the Lord in a, a real capacity of, of being the high priest. Okay, all right, so he's, those have been changed. Verse 6 says, The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern mine house and have charge of my courts. Then I will give you a place among those standing here. Listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to send my servant, the branch. See uh, the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on uh, that one stone, 
and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine in fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. So here is Joshua, the high priest. And like I said, Joshua, the high priest, is going to be symbolic of the, the religious aspect of the Jews coming back into the land. All right? And so it's important for the high priest in, so that he can continue that course that he's going to be following the Lord's commands and actually doing. The, the, the high priest back before that, they would allow idolatry to come into the temple and everything like that. And so, you know, this is Zechariah giving Joshua, you know, a, a reminder, you, you need to walk before the Lord. But notice um, that it says that he's going to bring his servant, the branch. Now, who is that? It's Jesus. If you recall in the book of Isaiah, here we have the stump of Jesse. All right, and from the stump of Jesse, a sprout is going to spring up, a branch, which is symbolic of, of Jesus Christ. And so from the house of David, here we have Jesus Christ coming and ruling and reigning. And so here is this branch. Now, Joshua is going to be a, a, a figure of Jesus Christ here in terms of what Joshua and Jesus are going to do, okay? So if Joshua the high priest is symbolic of the religious um, aspect of, of the Jews, then what about Jesus? You know, when, when he came to the earth the first time, did he come as a political ruler? No, as he did not. You know, when Pilate said, you are a king, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. He did not come as a, a, a political ruler at that time. But what did he come to do? To save, to save us. And also, he came to be um, our great high priest, didn't he? Okay. Because with the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus, he therefore is able, as our high priest, to go in and make atonement for our sin. Okay. And so here is is Joshua, and here is the branch, Jesus Christ. And can you see how, you know, that the, the Joshua is going to, to kind of be a, a, a symbol of what Jesus is going to do, okay? So you got questions about that? Okay, so what can we say as far as just simply, a, you know, if we're going to give a, a simple statement about what this vision means, what are we going to say? Well, we're going to say um, that Joshua um, was purified to lead Israel and um, be a prefigure of Christ. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, if you say, no, I've got something else, then let me know. But I, I think that's it. Okay. So now moving into chapter 4. Chapter 4, we've got uh, a vision that, that probably is, is I, I think, one of the more, maybe the most popular of uh, Zechariah, okay? Which is the vision of the golden lampstands and the two olive trees. So, verse 1, it says, Then the angel who talked with me returned and awakened me as a man is awakened from his sleep. He asked me, What do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with the bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. Okay, so um, here is a, a maybe kind of a figure of what 
um, um, you know, Zachariah saw, so, so to speak, okay? Uh, I could have drawn it out, but, y you know, just didn't want to take the, the time to do it. By the way, I don't know who to give it. I just Googled this and, you know, copied the, the image. I don't know who to give the credit to because it was on a whole bunch of different websites. <laughs> so, so whoever the, uh, you know, the, um, the artist is that, that came up with this, if they just happen to come across th this on YouTube, um, you know, the credit to you, unknown, unknown author, okay, unknown artist. But I just wanted to bring this up because, you know, this way we can kind of see what's going on a little bit. And so here we've got these two olive trees, and, well, the, it's cut off a little bit. So I'm going to draw that a little bit more, but, you know, we've got more of the, of the olive tree there, and we've got more of the olive tree going on right there, okay? And in between those two olive trees, um, you notice that we've got this um, uh, candlestick that's there. And we've got seven candles. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. Now, uh, the way candles were candlesticks back then, it's not like a wax candle with wick. It is a wick that's going to be going down into a bowl and that bowl is going to be filled with olive oil, okay? And so in this case, what we have is one big bowl that's there, and then we've got these channels, and I don't know how these channels are going to be, but anyway, this is the, you know, you get the idea about what it is, but the, we've got channels for the olive oil to come up through uh, to, get to, the, uh, to get to the lights, to get to the wicks, okay? Now... Here we've got these two olive trees, and you think, okay, well, what in the world are these things right here? Well, we go on down, and uh, if we skip, um, let me see. Well, if we skip on down to verse number 11, it says, Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and left of the lampstand? And again, I asked him, what are those two olive branches beside the two golden pipes that pour in oil? And so later, we see that these two golden pipes are pouring in oil to this bowl, okay? So, now that we kind of understand what the vision is, what, you know, as far as what he sees, you know, what in the world is this? So, going back to verse number four, we see that he asked the angel who's talked to me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, you do not know what these are? No, my Lord. I replied, and so, you know, at least we're in the same boat as Zachariah is at this point. What in the world is this? Okay, so he said to me in verse number six, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. He will bring out the captives to shouts of God bless it. God bless it. Okay, so if you remember, I said that, that um, Joshua is going to be the, the, polit or, or the, the, the religious leader. Zerubbabel is going to be the political leader at that time. Okay, and so here we've got Zerubbabel. And if you remember, what did the Jews come back into the land to do? To rebuild the temple, right? And who's going to be the responsible person involved? Who's in charge of it? Zerubbabel. It's not going to be Joshua. Joshua is going to be more focused on what to do with the temple once it gets built. Right? Okay. But as far as the building of the temple, that's going to be Zerubbabel's job. Now, if you remember, when they came back into the land, they made a pretty good start on it, and they laid the foundation. But what happened? They ran into obstacles, and they ran into problems, and the, the project got derailed and sidetracked. Now we've got Haggai coming in, and you remember that Haggai and Zechariah are both prophesying about the same time. This is happening just, uh, you know, I, I forgot how many days later, but a short time later after Zach, uh, Haggai gave his prophecy. And so this is going to be a word of encouragement to, to Zerubbabel, because you remember, he faced that obstacle and things got derailed before. He still has a lot of headwinds to go. It's not as if things are going to be smooth sailing, is it? 
And so, you know, Zerubbabel, how are you going to do this? Well, it's not going to be by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And so that's one thing that we can uh, think of and kind of take a lesson of for, you know, for our work and our service for the Lord. Um, if it is by our might or if it's by our power, um, either the success that we have isn't going to be a success that the Lord wants, number one, or number two, it's not going to be a success at all. It's going to be a failure. Instead, the, the work that we have needs to be by the Lord's power. And if it's by the Lord's power, um, then, you know, we can accomplish what the Lord wants. It doesn't man, mean that we can go and do what we want. Uh, it means that we're going to be able to accomplish what the Lord wants if we go into His power. Now, when you look at oil in the Bible, frequently oil, olive oil, is going to be symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And so what we see here is just simply the power that is involved in Zerubbabel's mission that's going to be there. It's not going to be by his strength, his power. Instead, it's going to be, be by the Lord's Spirit. And the, the Lord's Spirit is going to be with him to the point that even if there is a mountain in his way, it's going to be a level playing field, you know, level place uh, in order for him to accomplish his task, so to speak. Okay? So we read on down. In verse number 8, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Okay? And so this, when this is given, temple has not yet been built. As a matter of fact, they're on the very early stages of its rebuilding. And so here is an encouragement to Zerubbabel. You laid the foundation. You're going to complete it. But the reason why you're going to complete it is with the Lord. Now, verse number 10, it says, Who despises the day of small things? You remember that uh, the temple, as they were rebuilding it, wasn't quite as big and fancy as what Solomon was in his day, right? It says, Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel because it's not as big and grandose, grand, grandiose as what Solomon's temple was, but it doesn't matter. It's still the temple of the Lord, and the fact that, that the Lord is there, people are still going to rejoice. And you go back to um, uh, the, the verse number 7, where it says, He will bring out the captive shouts of God bless it, God bless it. It's the idea about God blessing, God having grace, giving grace to the temple itself. Okay? All right, you got questions about that before we continue with this? Because there's actually more to it. Okay, so continuing into uh, verse number 10, we have a little bit of a parenthetical statement there, don't we? It says, These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range throughout the earth. What seven are we talking about here? The lights, okay? And so we've got the Lord's vision that's there. In verse number 11, Then I asked the angel, What are those two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And again I asked him, What are those two uh, olive branches beside the two uh, gold pipes that pour out golden oil? And so he replied, You do not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord in all the earth. Okay? So, um, Zerubbabel is not the lamp, is he? Because the lamp are, what it says there in verse number 10, it's the, the eyes of the Lord which range through the earth. And so it is, is what the, the Lord is seeing, it's what the Lord is doing. All right? And what is powering all of it. It's the Holy Spirit. Okay. All right. Now, what about these two different trees? It says here that these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord in all the earth. So, I, th I think that it's pretty apparent that one is Joshua. The other one is Zeru. Babel. Okay? 
because here we've got the two men at that time that are anointed to do what the Lord wanted them to do. Joshua with the religious side of things, Zerubbabel with the political side of things. Okay? And so, um, you know, here is Joshua, and I, I know that this is kind of, it's like, okay, well, Joshua, you know, is this Joshua supplying the, the, the oil or the power to this? No, it, that's why, you know, Zerubbabel is right here before that. You know, so we've got two different kind of meanings that are going on. Zerubbabel at the very beginning where he said, what is this? And he says, this is um, uh, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Okay. So here we've got that. Um, but when you look at this, you know, some people say, wait, there's, there's more meaning to this. Okay. Let's go on over to the book of Revelation chapter 11. And this is why uh, this vision in uh, Zechariah is probably the most uh, well-known of all of these eight visions. Is right here. So in Revelation chapter 11, verse number 1, it says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and commit, uh, count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it had been given over to the Gentiles. And I will... They will trample the holy city for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy there for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. By the way, if you go back to our study in the book of Revelation, um, how, how long is 1,260? 42 months, which is three and a half Jewish years. Okay? All right, well... So, going on to verse number four, notice what it says there. These, talking about these two witnesses, are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, you look at um, Zechariah, we've only got one lampstand, right? You know, and you look at this, we've got two lampstands. And so there's a little bit, it stretches a little bit, right? But that's okay because we're talking about symbolism here. And the symbolism, one, is, is very similar to the symbolism of the other. And so what we've got are these two witnesses that are there. And so um, we're just going to say witness number one and witness number two. Because, you know, you, you look at this, there's, there's a variety of opinion about the identity of these two witnesses. I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to say witness number one and witness number two. But just in the same manner that you had Joshua and Zerubbabel, who were the Lord's anointed, doing the Lord's business of the earth at that time, later on in the end time, for three and a half years, you're going to have the two witnesses that are anointed to do what the Lord wanted them to do at that time as well. And just as Joshua and Zerubbabel had the spirit of the power of the Lord, and that is how they were able to accomplish their tasks, then we also have these two witnesses there that are doing that same thing. Okay? All right. You got questions on that? Okay. I know you've got questions on it. <laughs> yeah. The one question I have is in the beginning when they talk about the stick with the seven eyes. Is that what they're talking about still even in there? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about... Um, oh, I'm, I'm looking at Revelation. I need to go back to Zechariah, don't I? Are you talking about with Joshua? Because it, with Joshua, a stone is stepped before Joshua with seven eyes. Okay, and so do we have that with um, the, the, we have uh, in verse number 10 that the seven eyes are the, se uh, the seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range the, out the earth. Okay, and so again, we've got these seven eyes that are there in both Joshua, um, the vision of Joshua and the vision of Zerubbabel here. 
which is representative of just simply the 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 all the all encompassing knowledge, the perfect knowledge, and the insight of God. Uh, because seven is going to represent the number of completion and perfection. And so here is God's vision, His sight, um, His knowledge of what's going on. And so here we have the the Lord fully understanding and seeing with with perfect insight of all of those things. Okay?